G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here with Rear Vision, the Murray Darling Basin, part two. Backs and improved waterworks. The total savings the equivalent of more than one million Olympic swimming pools. How successful were the water buybacks? Well, interestingly enough, yes, there's a lot of contentious discussion about the water buybacks. It tended to be at a high political level i.e. major lobby groups at the individual level where willing irrigators essentially sold their irrigation licenses, those decisions were being made often and in lots of places. And people were coming to governments to sell their irrigation license. These were willing sellers. There was no one going around twisting arms and saying, you have to sell your water. And it was going well. It was the cheapest way to get water back into the river system. And then the current coalition put a stop to it, essentially said it's not going to happen anymore because it's having too much impact on irrigation communities. And that was largely because of what they call the Swiss cheese effect, which was if you bought back various irrigators here, there and everywhere, the delivery systems to get to all the remaining irrigators would be that much more expensive and have more impact on current users, which was more to do with the Murray River Valleys than the Northern Darling River Valleys. Having said that, obviously there was a target of 2750 to be reached, and so the government said, well, Murray-Darling Basin Authority, you show us how you're going to reach that with the states, and they have subsequently come up with a whole range of water efficiency projects. And these are euphemistically looking at ways of making these rivers operate more efficiently in somewhat in an engineering sense with only a relatively nod and a wink to the environmental consequences and there are lots of questions about how much water they're going to deliver and whether or not they're actually going to be good for the environment. Just looking at the buybacks, how close did the buybacks come to buying back the amount of water that was the target? I'm not sure exactly what the current figure is, but it's around 2,000 gigalitres. So around two thirds of the way towards the final target, that compromise target, if you like. I guess the other thing that's happened is that there was 2750, but there was always a discussion about whether or not the amount of water in the northern basin was too much. So last year we saw an amendment to the basin plan Originally, 390 gigalitres of water each year were to go back into the environment in the Darling River catchments. And the Murray-Darling Basin Authority did a whole lot of science, and I've been very critical of that science, and the socioeconomics tended to be predominantly around irrigation industries, and recommended to the Parliament that 70,000 megalitres or 70 gigalitres be taken off that target and be left with the irrigation industry. And they argued that successfully, and the Labor Party and the Senate supported the current government to take that 70,000 megalitres off the table, and that would have been water that would have been fundamentally important for the Darling River. Mike Young says that the Murray-Darling Basin Authority has never been truly shielded from political pressure. The authority members are independent, but they report to a ministerial council, and there's a lot of negotiation backwards and forwards. Compare that with the Reserve Bank, where the Reserve Bank has a terms of reference, and the governors of the Reserve Bank meet regularly. They decide how much Australia is going to invest and how to control inflation. And no politician gets in the room, and no politician gets a right to say, look, we need to talk further about that. They make the decision. And it's final. And there's a very important reason for that. And that is that economic circumstances change by the fortnight, every two or three weeks. And you need to be highly responsive. And guess what? Water does exactly the same thing. If it rains, there's a lot of water around. If you get to the end of August and it's dry, and then if no rain comes in September, then we have a drought. And it's those last two weeks that change the rules tremendously. And that's why you need an independent authority that can move quickly, nimbly, and also take very tough decisions.
Mary-Anne Slattery is senior water researcher at the Australia Institute, an independent think tank, and was previously a director of environment water policy at the Murray Darling <coughs> Basin Authority. Well, one of the things that I've really observed when I was at the Murray Darling Basin Authority is this compromise between science and politics. Science is always, you know, debatable. There's lots of, you know, different scientific opinions about what should be the right number or what's the right amount of water we're going to need for this ecosystem. So that's always going to just inform a decision. And the decision's ultimately, I mean, something like this, ultimately a political decision. But what I started to see started in about 2014. So you had the... Maritime Basin Authority that was sort of coordinating all of these supply measure projects to determine how much water could be returned to production and taken away from the environment. Now, rather than saying, well, this is the science and this is the, the number that the scientific communities agreed is what this project's going to achieve environmentally and how much water it needs, and we understand that it doesn't match the politics, but you know, whatever is chosen as the number is a political decision, not a scientific decision. And the Murray-Darling Basin Authority started on this slippery slope of conflating the two and trying to retrofit the science to match the number rather than keeping the science separate from the politics. The authority's role was also criticised in the recent Productivity Commission's assessment of the Basin Plan. The Basin Authority is supposed to both implement the plan and ensure compliance with the plan. And the Productivity Commission, identifying this conflict of interest, recommended that the authority be split into two. Just as government policy has changed the nature of the rivers, it's also profoundly affected the lives of the people who depend on them for their livelihood and indeed their drinking water. I think as a starting point, the policy framework for the Basin Plan is actually very good with a couple of exceptions. One of those exceptions is that there's no policy framework for regional economic development. So the only tools the Commonwealth had, if you like, was to go in and buy water from willing sellers, but that didn't do anything to support the communities that were left. Part of the water reform, so predating the Basin Plan, is to separate water from land. The idea at the time was that water could then be traded to its highest value use. Most policy makers at the time thought that meant that water would go to the highest value commodity, when I think what we're actually seeing is that it is moving to a higher value commodity, which is nuts and cotton, but it's also scale. So we're seeing a lot of large agribusinesses, a lot of which are foreign, now owning water, and it's moving away from irrigation districts and out of irrigation schemes in the south and moving away from family farms. So in this last drought, for example, the drought in Bird Barnaby Joyce was calling initially for water to be made available to grow fodder. As he was saying that, at the time, people that were growing fodder in Victoria were actually selling their water down to Southern Asia where there's huge plantations of new nut developments because they were just getting such high prices for their water for nuts. So we're seeing more of that and we're seeing a real change in the face of agriculture in the basin and that's moving away from a diverse agricultural industry of rice, fodder, fruit and vegetables, dairy. The water from those industries is going into cotton and nuts and we're going to end up with a dominant of these two commodities in the basin. And I think the other thing that we're seeing is a real loss of family farms and that's having a real impact on some of our regional communities. You know, they're really struggling and I think when Australians realise what this reform has done to the face of agriculture and what that has done in terms of who's producing, they'll be really horrified. We're roughly halfway along the Basin Plan timeline and there's been plenty of criticism. The Murray-Darling Declaration, signed a year ago, expresses the concerns of some of Australia's environmental scientists and economists. Richard Kingsford is a signatory. I guess if I was giving it a report card, I would give it a 6 out of 10, just a pass. And I think there are some things like the water buyback, which have been fantastic. They've been good for the irrigation industry, irrigators in particular, and very good for the environment. 
I think the way in which states have implemented the plan has gone back to some of the bad old days of essentially states doing what they did and wanted to do under the Murray-Darling Basin Commission and thumbing their nose at a federal oversight whole of river basin management. And I think, you know, issues around climate change, measuring water and compliance, protecting environmental water so that it actually works its way down through the system. These are all areas where there is a lot of room for improvement. We need to be able to come back to the truth. At the moment, any critics of the implementation of the Basin Plan are put into a camp as either being a rabid, greeny ideologue or an ignorant, redneck irrigator. And there's lots of propaganda and governments covering each other's backsides to pretend it's all okay. We're on the course, we're going to deliver the Basin Plan on time in, in full. It's difficult, but partway through the reform, we've got to stay on track and so on. There's no recognition of what has gone wrong. This is a really ambitious policy reform. There's $13 billion at stake. It just doesn't make any sense that we could have such an ambitious policy, world's first, without having to reset some of the policy settings or rethink some of the policy settings and to think that things haven't gone wrong. At the moment, we can't even have a truthful conversation about what's working and what isn't and what parts of the policy setting we need to reset. And I think until we can do that, we're not going to be able to move forward and fix this. The ecological disaster wiping out life in the state's major river system goes from bad to worse. Another major fish kill has happened at Menindee on the Darling River. Once again, algal blooms and low oxygen levels in the water are to blame. I think it's fair to say that we are facing the makings of an ecological disaster in Australia's greatest river system, the Murray-Darling. You'd have to think that yet another fish kill last week at Menindee and the damning findings of the South Australian Royal Commission should surely make reform of the management of the Murray-Darling Basin a political priority and one that goes beyond party politics. If you'd like to know more than I've been able to cover today, do browse the ABC website. There are excellent stories from <coughs> News, Four Corners and RN's background briefing. The people you heard on the program were environmental historian Daniel Connell former members of the Murray-Darling Basin Commission, Don Blackmore and John Scanlon, Professor Mike Young from the University of Adelaide, Professor Richard Kingsford from the University of New South Wales, and Mary Ann Slattery from the Australia Institute. Russell Stapleton is the sound engineer for this rear vision. Bye for Kerry Phillips. Okay, well, that was Rear Vision, Murray Darling Basin, part two. I had no idea that that was going to run starting at midday, but I was lucky enough to be able to catch nearly all of it in the two parts. And that's good because this morning on the round table, they spent a full half hour discussing when the rivers run dry. And it's brilliant that we've now got the Rear Vision and I can post that first and then I'll probably make some other video about something else and stick that in between and the two part round table upload <clears throat> because I don't want to sort of completely bore viewers who are not interested at all in Australian microclimate river responses and political mismanagement but it's kind of important and it's happening right now and, and it's probably going to get worse because they say we're going into a, an El Nino and apparently the hot weather is going to last till at least April, maybe the end of April. Um, and El Ninos normally come good in about February or March, I think. So yeah, it, it, we, we could have another whole year of horrible things happening on the river from not enough water and such is life. I've got to say that successive governments, the Labor government, the Liberal national government, they have pretty much done everything they could to make it as bad as possible. They've ignored the scientists and they've gone with the economists. 
and they've gone with the political activists in the irrigation industry. And I think they're just going to keep going, but I'll let you be the judge of it when they get a scientist and they get the more the Maury Shire Mayor, Katrina Hodges or Humphreys? Humphreys, I don't know. Anyway, we're into the upload limit. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Things is crook and tullerook and we'll all be ruined, said Hanrahan. Ciao.